Good afternoon, Paris. So, uh, as you can see, chaos management during a major incident. So that was actually a lie. I'm here to talk about failures. Many of us might have actually done this, right? Pseudo RMRF, this harmful command in production, causes us those moments of panic and terror so that half of our engineering team might end up getting paged. So this talk is essentially going to be about failures and most importantly about how we deal with failures. What to do when your database is on fire could, be, could have been a subtitle for this talk. So as Richard Cook has put it really well, failure-free operations require experience to deal with failure. What does that even mean? It means that in order to deal with a new failure, you first need to have experienced it beforehand. And that seems really counterintuitive. So this is how this talk is structured. This talk is structured around a war story of mine. By war story, I mean an op operations nightmare that I faced. Next, after that, we'll talk about a framework that is based upon real life incident management and incident response practices and apply it to the world of IT and incident, like IT operations management. At the end, we'll talk about the human sides of things, things like saying no when you're getting paged. So let's begin. So this is a story that happened very long ago when I used to be uh, a very junior engineer right out of college, working for a small startup. And chapter one, we start, this is fine. It was the middle of the night on a Friday. I ended up getting paged. Somehow, I managed to scramble my way through all of those you know, those weird Slack rooms and like hip chat rooms to a Hangouts link. And suddenly I see like almost every single engineer I know was on that call. Everyone was on call, around like 16 to 17 people were trying to talk and trying to get to do something. Someone had even dialed in from a bar. <laughs> like there was a lot of background noise, I suppose. And I finally figured out that someone was talking from, from a bar. It turns out that one of our background job processing servers had stopped processing, and a big customer had called in to say that, hey, looks like I'm seeing stale data. And that had caused like 16 people in the middle of the night to log in in a Hangouts room and try to see what's going on wrong. Unfortunately, most of us were doing the same exact thing, running, grep, going into the servers, and trying to see what's going on. Most importantly, we really didn't know where to start. That brings us to chapter two, dark and stormy night. As we must have all guessed, this is a famous anti-pattern in English literature. It was a dark and stormy night. The rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals when it was checked by a violent gust of wind. This is almost the answer given by any engineer on the call whenever we ask, hey, what are you doing right now? And people would come up with things like, er, I'm just you know, logging into this machine and just like doing something, something really vague and ambiguous, something like this. So essentially, there was no one to coordinate. And which kind of brings us now to chapter three, the exec soup. In the middle of all of this chaos that was ensuing just because some job was not running in a server, we had someone from our senior management jump onto the call and say, hey, can you send me a spreadsheet with all of the affected customers? It might sound really stupid, and trust me, I was on the receiving end of this order, and what, what was done next was well, we ended up not working on fixing the actual problem, and all of us, like 16 people, ended up running a job, another script, on another production box just to get the list of affected customers, which meant that our problem, the solution to our problem was delayed by a few hours, which meant our customers were suffering for a few more hours. Now, we move on to the final chapter, the morning after. So the night finally ended, and after the end of the dark and stormy night, we finally moved on to the morning after. We had solved the problem and identified the issue as an issue with some sort of upstream cloud provider, like the ones that we must have all seen. And uh, the next morning, we walk into our jobs just to be greeted by our managers, saying that you're the person to be blamed for this major incident. That must have caused like hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of potential revenue impact for newer customers because our reliability had gone down. And we had to conduct something called of a root cause analysis. God knows we, we really didn't know what was the underlying problem, and now we had this burden of doing a root cause analysis. We, to be honest, back then we didn't even know what the problem was. So that was our story. Do we see anything wrong with the picture? I don't really mean the cat is upside down. I mean, a lot of things we just saw in the story are common operational anti-patterns. And uh, let's uh, actually just try to narrow it down to two major things that was wrong with this entire story. The two things that was wrong was, the first thing was we really didn't know the common business metric to which all of the engineers should react. It was not an all hands on deck situation. 
The second thing was we didn't really have a framework to deal with these sorts of failures. Your system might have five nines of reliability, but that 0.00001%, whenever that shit hits the fan, it's really important that you have a framework to deal with it. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So the first thing, in, in order to actually identify what's an all-hands-on-deck situation, it's important to define, prepare, and measure your business metrics. What does that even mean? It means that if you're an online retailer like Amazon, if your number of checkouts per second falls below a certain threshold on a Black Friday, that's like your peak day of the year in which you make sales, you need to go and say like, hey, this is an all hands on deck situation, we need to do something. If you are Netflix and if your number of streams per second falls down, you need to go and do something. If you are like my employer, PhD duty, and in case your number of outgoing notifications go down, you do something. So the most critical step is to define a business metric and have the entire company buy into it. The second thing is preparation. And there has been like a lot of good material on this. Uh, I'm not going to really repeat, but you can run things like chaos engineering, game days, whatever you call, in order to prepare your infrastructure for such changes that might occur. The third thing is measurement. That's generally not seen very well, but essentially what you do is you measure an impact and then you kind of feed it back into the system. So you run like simulations of failures after measuring those. Next is one of the most important things that as a company we should all do is failure should be unique. If not, you should all be automating the response. What, means, what this means is that if you have a server that's running high on disk usage, you should not end up paging the entire company for that. Someone could, you could just write a cron that cleans up things, right? So you should only trigger a major incident to response if you need to do one. Do not waste human potential on things that can be automated. Now comes to the fun part. What do you do when things actually fail? So at my employer, PGDD, what we do is we kind of apply the National Incident Management System's NIMS-based procedure to deal with operational failure in the world of software. While it might seem really counterintuitive that uh, to apply some real-world framework into the world of IT operations, but trust me, there are parts uh, which are similar and familiar, like uh, really similar between the two sorts of systems, and uh, it kind of has worked for us so far. So the core of this lies in, like as software engineers, what we must all know, the single responsibility principle, which means that one individual who is present on a major incident to their response should be doing exactly one thing, nothing more than that. That would remove multiple people doing the same thing. Like for example, in my story, we had like 16 engineers doing the same thing. All of that would go away if you follow the single responsibility principle. To actually narrow it down, we can like define roles for the people present on a call. The first role is of the subject matter expert. A subject matter expert is someone who knows enough about the software to go and figure out a problem and solve. That does not mean there's just one subject matter expert on a call. There could be multiple people, experts in different domains, different part of the system, things like databases, servers, architectures, what not. So you can have multiple like, SMEs present on the call, but make sure that not two of them are doing the same thing at the same time, obviously. The next and one of the most important roles in an incident call is of the incident commander. An incident commander is someone who acts as the single source of truth during any major incident. An incident commander is responsible for running the entire incident call. The core responsibility of the incident commander includes things like notifying the entire company by means of Slack, email, or any sort of other notification service that the company is in the middle of a major incident. The next responsibility of the incident commander is to verify that all service, all SMEs are present on the call. Next is to divide and conquer the task, which means the incident commander's responsibility is to break, break down the entire issues into smaller tasks, subtasks, and assign it to these subject matter experts, and then go back and check how how and what the progress has been made, and if at all required, pull in other subject matter experts to help these out. The main other pillar for an effective incident commander to run a successful incident response is effective communication. An incident commander should avoid the bystander effect. What do you mean by that? It means rather than asking questions like, please say yes if you think it's a good idea to do so in a, during a major incident, and a good incident commander needs to ask things like, is there any st strong objection to do that? This helps avo avoid the bystander effect altogether and makes the incident response much more swift. The next role is of the, the deputy. 
So the deputy sort of acts as your added layer of protection against an incident commander not being able to present uh, during a major incident. It means that the deputy acts as a hot standby and assists the incident commander in whatever they are doing. They also get all subject matter experts. For, science, for, for a new SME who joins the call, the deputy acts so that they can fill them up with any sort of information that is required. They also liaise with the stakeholders, which means provide these executive updates to avoid things like the exec soup that I just talked about in my story. The next role is of the scribe. Remember, during my story, I was talking about doing a root cause analysis and not having any sorts of info about what exactly did we do? The scribe solves this problem. The scribe documents the timeline of a major incident as it progresses. The scribe also acts as a bridge between two different communication layers. Imagine that someone's type typing in commands on your Slack or HipChat channel, and someone's just talking on an audio or a Hangouts call. The scribe just does acts as a bridge, writing these down and making sure that everyone, despite the different mediums of communication that they are talking in, are on the same page. The next role, which is sort of a non-engineering organization-centric role, is of a customer liaison. Now, imagine that you're a cloud provider and like, you, you, you just went down, which means like, you must have like, had a big major outage. In that scenario, you must have had like, a lot of engineers trying to solve the problem. This is where the customer liaison comes in. When you're, all of your engineers are busy firefighting during a major incident, a customer liaison, generally someone from your customer support or your customer-facing org, uh, is responsible for communicating with the customers and making sure that they are well aware that you are actively trying to solve the problem. They also do things like sending out tweets saying, or doing some status page updates saying that we know that there's a problem with the systems and there are engineers actively trying to fix it. They also do the vice versa of this approach, which means they also inform the incident commander that this is what our customers expect right now. Based upon that, the incident commander can make the right judgment call. So these were all of the roles that we saw. And uh, one, thing to, one thing very important to, to realize that these roles are not set in stone. So it is really important to realize that during a long-running major incident, people might feel tired. So it's completely OK to do a transfer of command and do a handoff to someone else. You could just say, I'm not the incident commander anymore. And so X and Y is now the incident commander for this incident call and just step down. The other core pillar, which we all might be well aware of is a blameless postmortem, which means like in my story, when I was put the, the blame for the entire incident uh, is essentially a toxic culture to have. So it's very important for organizations to avoid blame in order to do postmortems. Remember, you can't fire your way into reliability. Now, let's look at the human sides and just do a quick review of what I just spoke in the past 14 minutes or so. Shit happens, prepare for it. No matter how, not many, how many number of nines that your system actually have, has, there's always a possibility that things will go down, so you need to be prepared for it. Run your game days, your failure Fridays, and your chaos engineering really well. Develop on-call empathy. So if you're an exec, you should be able to empathize well with the incident commander and have faith that the system is going to work out. Having trust in your people is always the way of success. Organizations which are successful do this regularly, so make sure that you develop on-call em empathy. And the same thing goes out for developers on the call. Remember, companies do not need on-call heroes. You do not get a medal for being an on-call hero. So be a team player and develop on-call empathy. Do whatever you're assigned, report to the incident commander, and try to find a resolution to the major incident. And the major takeaway and the last sentence of this talk is that People are the most valuable asset. Don't burn them out doing something that can be automated. Do not trigger a major incident response for every single system failure that you see. Major incident response, like I mentioned earlier, should be reserved for something that is really mission critical. Identify your metrics and run these things only if it's really required. And uh, that pretty much it sums my talk. Thank you.